stand up South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a thing. A very good morning, Africa Zonga, Africa and the world. I'm super excited to bring you the first installment of the EFF podcast of the year, of course, 2024. Happy New Year to you and yours. My name is Titus Tungu. And as always, we're coming to you from Winnie Madigizela Mandela House. In the building, ladies and gentlemen, I have with me fighter Carl Nihas. He is the former uh, ANC spokesperson and member of the MK uh, comrade uh, Kalni has a very good morning to compliments of the new season and welcome uh, to the show. Good morning, fighter Titus. <laughs> I thought you're going to call me fighter too because that's what I should be called now. <laughs> sure, fighter. And it is a great yeah. honor to be here yeah. in the Winnie Madikazela Mandela mm -hmm. house and it's a great honor to be so warmly welcomed. Mm -hmm in the economic freedom fighters. Indeed, the, the only economic emancipation movement in our country. Now, exactly. I want us to look at your African name. You seem to like it, Mbangazita. Why do you like this name? Well, I am a fighter. Mm -hmm. And the name was given to me many years ago by yeah. King Zuelatini. Yeah. And then subsequently it was formalized also mm -hmm. by the... Yabe Nguni Council, traditional oh. council. Okay. And there are many different translations to, it, yeah. to the name Mpangazita. Mm -hmm. The one means you're a planner. I think I'm a planner. You are, absolutely. But uh, the one I really like mm -hmm. is what King Zuelatini said to me. He said the deep Zulu name, which was meant by Shaka when he gave to one of his warrior um, leaders in his army, the name mm -hmm. meant he who eats his enemies alive. Oh. And I hope that the African National Congress, <laughs> which is your enemy, and Cyril Ramaphosa, <laughs> and yeah. the blower of hot air and wind, mm -hmm. Fikile Mbalula, understands what my name means. <laughs> he who eats what his child enemies is coming alive. for you is going to eat you all. <laughs> all right, maybe in the latter part of uh, yeah. our conversation, we're going to understand how your mm. name, in fact, uh, resonates with the person that you are. Mm. But now, let's try and understand who Karl Nihans is and where, where do you originate from? Titus, I'm 64 years old. Mm -hmm. I was born 64 years ago. Mm -hmm in a small town in what was then called the Western Transvaal, now it's the Northwest province, mm -hmm. Zerest. All right. I grew up in a conservative white Africana family. Mm -hmm. And at the age of 16, mm -hmm. for the first time, and this is also an indictment about the kind of apartheid racist society that I lived in, for the first time at the age of 16, mm -hmm. I went to Soweto okay. and I was absolutely appalled and shocked by the conditions that I saw there. I remember I went into one of the mining hostels and the squalor, the, yeah, the terrible conditions under which people were living mm -hmm. shocked me because I made the contrast between the comfortable middle-class, white, Africana life that I was living mm -hmm. and what I saw the majority of South Africans living and suffering under. Mm -hmm. And that changed my life. It was a kind of watershed moment yeah. in my life. And I started asking questions, but how can we tolerate apartheid? How can apartheid be acceptable? Oh. And it was a couple of months after I went into Soweto that the Soweto 1976 uprisings, yeah. June 76 uprisings yeah. happened. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went to my all white, all Afrikaans school in Witpoorki, a very Afrikaans lower middle class suburb. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I said, but I think the young people in Soweto are correct to protest. Yeah. 
they are right to rise up against this oppression. Yeah. And by the way, Soweto was the epicenter of political Absolutely. Uh, uh, activism yes, at yes, the time. Yes. You, mm-hmm. you remember how Mama Winnie Manikazela Mandela's mm-hmm. home was part of that yes. epicenter, mm-hmm. the home in the Lakazi Street, mm-hmm. and the role that she and many others yes. played together with the very courageous young people mm-hmm. who stood up against the apartheid system, yeah. who were faced by the security police and by the army. They sent in the armored vehicles. They killed literally thousands of people. I mean, I don't think up to this day we know exactly how many young people were killed in 1976 and the resistance of the youth subsequently. Mm -hmm. But we're sitting here in a revolutionary home Mm -hmm. and we know the role that Mama Winnie played in being with the youth. I don't want to say support the youth. She was Mm -hmm. with them. She was one of them. She was their leader. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Mama Winnie was one of those courageous people who never left the country. She stayed here. She stuck it out. She faced the security police and the oppression. Head on. And that is something we should always remember. And I think she is a guiding light for all of us on resistance and not allowing yourself to be coward. Yeah. Many years later, when I was sitting with Mama Winnie in her home, mm-hmm. she looked at me and she laughed. She says, my boy, I don't know what it means to give up. Mm. And that's what I love. And it's one of the things I also love about the EFF. Yes. The EFF is a party of people who don't give up. Fearless. Who stand, who are fearless, mm-hmm. who are fighters. Mm-hmm. You remember what happened to the commander-in-chief, Comrade Julius, and the other leaders of the ANC Youth League when they were expelled from the ANC? Absolutely. Now, many people would just give up, mm-hmm. would feel defeated. Yeah. Instead, out of that negative event that happened, that expulsion, They turned it around. Mm. They made it something immensely positive. They came forward with the formation of the economic freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. And it became a new hope Mm. for the future of our country and for the youth of our country. And I love the indomitable spirit Mm -hmm. of people such as our commander-in-chief, our deputy president, Comrade Floyd. Mm -hmm. They're not giving up. Yeah. And I think it is that spirit of fighting, Mm -hmm. of not giving up, that also meant Mm -hmm. that the decision was that this headquarters of the EFF Mm -hmm. had to be called Winnie Marikazela Mandela House because it epitomizes the spirit, the heart Mm -hmm. of what the economic freedom fighters is all about. Indeed. Now, let me take you back uh, a little bit. I want to understand what type of uh, upbringing you have had. How Mm -hmm. would you describe your uh, upbringing as an Afrikaner? Um, I mean, during apartheid, uh, obviously white people, Afrikaner were, Afrikaners were in fact privileged. And why and how was it, how were you able to in fact, um, you know, enter into the political array, uh, arena, and uh, become an activist at the time, um, mm-hmm. your background, your parents, were, did you get in, a, any support? As I said, I grew up in a very conservative mm-hmm. white Afrikaner home, in yeah. a very small conservative Afrikaans town, Yes, Zierest. Must have been very difficult for you. And when I started to ask questions, there was a ne- very, very negative response. Remember at the time when Mm -hmm. I really started my political activism, Mm -hmm. I was a student at the Rand Afrikaans University. Mm -hmm. And I was the first student at the RAU, which is today called the Johannesburg University, the University of Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. I was the first student who said that this university must be integrated. Mm -hmm. I stood for the Student Representative Council saying, 
We need a fully integrated university and Nelson Mandela must be released from prison mm -hmm. and the ANC and other liberation movements had to be unbanned. Mm -hmm. At that time, the liberation movements were all still banned and Mandiba was still in prison together mm -hmm. with many other political prisoners. Mm -hmm. Because I said that and because I put up posters at the old Rand Afrikaans University, I was expelled from the university. Mm -hmm. So my education was interrupted. Mm -hmm. My dad, a very conservative man, okay. was furious mm. because now I lost my bursaries to study. In fact, the family was plunged into financial difficulties because they had to repay mm -hmm. the bursaries that I got from Afrikaans bursary schemes, mm -hmm. from a bursary scheme that was known as the Afrikaans Taal and Kultur Vereniging. Mm. And when they heard that I was expelled, they said, this communist child, we want the money back. We're not going to pay for someone who behaves like this. So you were considered a sellout? I was considered a total sellout. I was considered to be a traitor, a friar in Afrikaans. Ne? My dad got so angry, he kicked me out of the house. This was at the age of 18. Mm -hmm. I had nowhere to go. Remember, I grew up in this Afrikaans family. I didn't have friends in progressive left circles. I was mm -hmm. just objecting to apartheid. Yes. So after my dad kicked me out of the house, I found myself walking the streets, sleeping in parks, on benches, because I had nowhere to go. Mm. And then one day I saw there was a newspaper poster from the old Suetan on one of the lamp poles saying that Father Simeon Kwane, who was then the dean of the Anglican Church of Johannesburg, mm -hmm. was praying and fasting because evictions were taking place from people in informal settlements. Mm -hmm. And I looked at that poster, I said, okay, let me go and meet with this man. Perhaps he can help me. Mm -hmm. So I walked all the way to uh, St. Mary's Cathedral yeah. here in the CBD of Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. I went to the PA of Father Mkwane. I said, I want to see the dean. Mm -hmm. This little Afrikaner boor boy standing there, she looked at me. She thought, hey, what's going on here? Yeah. But eventually she allowed me to see the dean. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, you know, young man, I think I must bring someone who will understand you better than me. Come back tomorrow. Mm. So the next day I came back and when I walked into his office, I got the fright of my life because there was an elderly white mm. Afrikaner man sitting in his office. You know, those safari suits. Yeah. with the short trousers and the long socks pulled up like mm -hmm. those old conservative Afrikaners wear. Yeah. And I thought, oh, this man went and called the security police. They're going to arrest me now. Mm. But I was wrong. The person who was sitting there was Dr. Bayers Nodia. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you know who Dr. Nodia yes. is. Uh, you know, he's much older than most yes. of us. Mm -hmm. But he was an Afrikaner clergyman. Mm -hmm. clergyman who decided that apartheid was wrong. Yeah. He resigned. From, in fact, he was kicked out of the Dutch Reformed Church mm -hmm. because he cloth. objected to yeah. apartheid. Mm -hmm. He started an organization called the Christian Institute, mm -hmm. and he was fighting against apartheid. Mm -hmm. So Wimbe understood this young Afrikaner boy because he came from the same culture, the same background. Mm -hmm. And I always say Wimbe became the father to me that my own father could not be to me because my father couldn't understand me. Mm -hmm. So Wimbe became my mentor, my father. Uh, he taught me a lot. Mm -hmm. I learned a lot about the struggle history, the liberation struggle history. He had a very modest home in Greenside in Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. And most of the time that I engaged with him, he was a banned person. Mm -hmm. So he could only see one person at a time. He couldn't leave his house uh, early in the morning than eight o'clock. And he had to be back six o'clock in the evenings back at home. Mm -hmm. But we always used to go and sit in the back garden under a peach tree. Mm -hmm. 
and he would have a small transistor radio and he'll turn it on loud so that if they try to listen to what we're saying, yeah. there's interference from yes. this radio. But he taught me about Comrade Oliver Reginald Tambo. Mm -hmm. It was through him that I met Mama Winnie Marie Casella Mandela the first time, Mama Helen Joseph. It was through him that I learned so much mm. about the liberation struggle. Yeah. And then I started working in Alexandra because I had no job. Yeah. Uh, I was this young Afrikaner boy who had been kicked out of his home, who was not any longer at university. Yeah. I also so, decided to leave yeah. the Dutch Reformed Church. I was also a member of the Dutch Reformed Church. And I said, I'm resigning from the church mm -hmm. because they believed in the theology of apartheid. Yeah. And I joined the same church where Wimbe was now in Alexandra. Mm -hmm. which was called the Dutch Reformed Church in Africa in 12th Avenue in Alex. And I also started working in Alexandra in an upholstery factory mm -hmm. where I learned to make upholstery because that was how I was then earning a small salary and able to sustain myself. Yeah. So you were on mm. your own at the time. Your father kicked, yeah. kicked you out of the house. Was your mother of the same sentiment? Did yes. she also reject you? Look, my mother, of course, is a mother. Yes. So she wasn't as strong as my dad. Mm -hmm. But remember, in the Afrikaans community, it's a very patriarchal society. And the woman in the house, the mother, takes the lead from the father. Mm -hmm. So she couldn't really go against my dad. Uh, she tried to be kinder to me than my dad was, mm -hmm. but she couldn't bring me back to the home. Because my dad said I had to leave. Yeah. And you must understand that the rest of the Afrikaner family mm -hmm. on both sides, from my mom's side and my dad's side, mm -hmm. were very much against me. In fact, they thought I was absolutely the worst possible thing that could have happened to the family. Yeah. And many of them up to this day still reject me and they've not accepted me. So they don't appreciate the fact that you chose to be on the side of the native uh, people of South Africa during you know, their time of oppression and obviously during the apartheid era. Titus, we have to accept mm -hmm. that the majority of white people and also Afrikaner people have not changed. Mm -hmm. The reality is that they still hold on to those old ideals of apartheid they still want to continue to think of themselves as a superior race. The reality is that they still hold on to the land. Mm -hmm. Behind you, there's a poster. It says, white people own 72% yes. of the land. Mm -hmm. That is a reality. Mm -hmm. And I'm very clear that the land must be returned to the people. Mm -hmm. It also means that those who have taken the land from the rightful owners, from the indigenous people in this country, mm -hmm. have to return the land. So now, that doesn't go down very well with some of these Afrikaner farmers. Mm. But you know what? Tough luck for them. They have to face the reality of the new South Africa. The land must be returned to the original owners and the land must be there for the wealth and the empowerment of the people. Mm -hmm. Let me give you an example. If you come and steal my car, mm -hmm. and I find out there's Titus's home, that is where my car is parked. Yes. Well, I go there with my wallet and come to you and say, Titus, can I pay you for my stolen car? That's nonsensical. Absolutely not. But unfortunately... That is what the ANC negotiated at Kudesa because we went and enshrined in the Constitution, mm -hmm. Section 25, mm -hmm. we went and enshrined property rights in the Constitution, which gives property rights to the white community mm -hmm. who are the benefactors of the colonial stealing of the land. Now we say if we want land, the land must be paid for. Isn't it the same as you've stolen my car, but if you want to, um, my car to go come back to me, I must pay you. Mm -hmm. 
That's absolute nonsense. So if the white community doesn't like the reality that they've been effectors of colonial thievery mm -hmm. and that the land must be returned to the rightful owners, mm -hmm. then it is hard luck for them. I hope that we can convince yeah. the Africana and white community to understand that reality, to participate in the return of the land mm -hmm. to the rightful owners, and for them to be a part of South African society. Yeah. But we cannot sugarcoat the reality mm -hmm, that course. the land must return to the people. Yeah. Why do you think the right-wingers are so against uh, expropriation of land without compensation. They like to have the land that they've stolen because land is the foundation of economic empowerment and wealth. Mm -hmm. At the absolute foundation of the disempowerment mm -hmm. of the people of this country, the majority of black, especially African people in this country, mm -hmm. was the loss of the land. Mm -hmm. What happened with the loss of the land meant mm -hmm. that the African people in this country lost economic power. And the only way economic power will be gained, regained, mm -hmm. is the return of the land. That's why central also to the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF is the return of the land to the people because it is the cornerstone of economic empowerment. Mm. And that is why when the commander in chief speaks so strongly about the return of the land, he's correct. Mm -hmm. Without the return of the land to the people, mm -hmm. without land restitution, mm -hmm. there is no economic empowerment mm -hmm. and there is no correct restitution away from the consequences of the old colonial exploitation mm -hmm. and the thievery of the wealth of the people of this country by white colonists. Mm -hmm. And of course, you have been a member of uh, the ANC, I'm not sure for how long, but the ANC... 43 years. 43 years. Mm -hmm. The ANC Actually, been... too long. Too long. <laughs> you know, I see here on this beautiful poster that you have this photo. Yes of the 10th anniversary march in Suwetu. I see there's also Advocate Dali Mpofu. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, Advocate Mpofu in 1983 was an article clerk at a law firm mm -hmm. that represented me when I was charged with high treason mm -hmm. before I was sentenced to 15 years of imprisonment because of my membership of the ANC. Mm -hmm. of to receive with my participation yeah. in the liberation struggle. Mm -hmm. When Advocate Mpofo yes. decided to leave the ANC, mm -hmm. we laughed the other day about it when I joined the Economic Freedom Fighters. I sent him a message, are you crazy? <laughs> <laughs> and he quite correctly reminded me, he said, no, yeah. I had sanity sure. more 10 years before sanity came to you. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I give him the credit yeah. that he saw what the ANC had become before mm. I had seen it. Mm. And I stayed, that's why I say 43 years, but many years too long, because I should have seen what was going on in the ANC. I should have seen how the ANC was selling out earlier. Yeah. I should have left the ANC earlier. Yeah, sure. But eventually, at least finally, mm -hmm. I left the ANC. For 30 years, more than 30 years now, the mm. ANC has failed to return the land to the people of South yeah. Africa. And there are many failures that we can point to. What mm. do you think has, in fact, led or has, you know, made the ANC fail to return the land to its people? What are some of the contributing factors to the ANC's failures on the land question? Titus, it's not just the land. It's also no free quality education, mm -hmm. no mm -hmm. proper health care, yes. uh, no decent housing. Mm -hmm. All of those promises that the ANC used to make. Mm -hmm. You know, the ANC was formed 
on the 8th of January 1912. And at the essence of its formation was the issue of land. Mm -hmm. But as the years went on, the ANC became also an organization that imbued in its existence an understanding of radical economic transformation. Mm -hmm. Also because of the role of the then South African Communist Party and the trade union movement. Mm -hmm. If you look at the strategy and tactics documents of the ANC in the 40s, the 50s, and the 60s, mm -hmm. it talks very eloquently about economic transformation. Mm -hmm. It talks about the return of the land, mm -hmm. about nationalization of the commanding heights of the economy, of the mines and all the big industries. Yes. It does all of that. And I believe at that point, the African National Congress was still a revolutionary organization. Mm -hmm. But the ANC got infiltrated. Okay. And that infiltration started already during the exile years. Mm -hmm. Because there was a plan by the big white monopoly capitalist companies in this country, also together with international imperialism. Mm -hmm to infiltrate the ANC, to also make some of the leaders of the ANC dependent on the funding and the finances that they were giving them. Mm. And they were starting to buy over people. Also, the intelligence services infiltrated the ANC, the CIA, mm -hmm. MI6, MI7 from the British side, mm -hmm. and many other Western intelligence agencies. Yeah. And, sorry. Now, I just want to yeah. emphasize this because right, sure. already in the mid-1980s, mm -hmm. when the ANC met with the big captains of industry oh, yes. from South Africa mm -hmm. in Lusaka, yes. if you listen to an interview that Comrade Ronnie Casuals mm -hmm. gave many years later, he says, I was absolutely shocked and surprised by how quickly the leadership of the ANC went belly up. Mm -hmm. And agreed with those captains of white monopoly capitalist big industry that the economy should not change, that there should not be a transfer of the land and of the big means of production into mm -hmm. the hands of the people. Mm -hmm. So then already the ANC had been infiltrated. Okay. But the worst thing that happened to the ANC was during the negotiating process, during Kudesa. Yes. When... Obviously, people like Cyril Ramaphosa, Praveen Gordon, and others mm -hmm. had already been made agents of white monopoly capitalism. But they were still appearing there as those who were working for the people, so to speak. Mm -hmm. They were still there as so-called members of the African National Congress. And they accepted a constitution that was going to make it totally, utterly impossible mm -hmm. for us to return the land to the people and to change the economic dynamics in this country. Mm -hmm. Then, of course, you also had sellouts such as Tito Mbueni, okay. who was an economic advisor coming from a very high-profile university in the United Kingdom and being taught everything about new liberal economic policies, da-da-da-da. Mm -hmm. And he then worked himself into the office of President Mandela to become his chief economic advisor. Mm -hmm. In 1991, Madiba went to the first World Economic Forum that he attended in Davao, January 1991. Mm -hmm. And what happened? Madiba had a speech that was given to him by the economic desk of the ANC, mm -hmm. which said... We're continuing with a policy of nationalization mm -hmm. of the land, nationalization of the mines, the big industries, etc. Mm -hmm. Tito took that speech sitting in his hotel room in Davao and scratched those paragraphs out, rewrote the speech all on his own for Madiba. The next thing, all of us who participated in writing that speech mm -hmm. And I was one of those 
So who Tito Mboweni participated is a, to write yeah. that speech. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, you wanted to ask me. Yeah. So Tito Mboweni is an enabler or was an enabler of uh, white monopoly capital. Oh, absolutely. Capital. Tito has always been. Mm -hmm. Tito was clearly a sellout right from the beginning. And I challenge him to come and tell me that he was not. But I was telling you this story. So mm -hmm. he changed that speech. So mm -hmm. there all of us are sitting. We're mm -hmm. listening to Madiba speaking at the World Economic Forum. Mm -hmm. And suddenly we hear that um, we are no longer going to nationalize the commanding heights of the economy. The land will be protected through property rights, etc. And we said, what the hell is going on? There's no decision taken in the National Executive Committee of the ANC to change our economic policy. Mm -hmm. But the reality was, at that stage, Madiba couldn't be contradicted. Mm -hmm. His power, his authority in the ANC was such mm -hmm. that it was very difficult, once he had spoken, to turn it around. So, you so T2, it. T2 yeah. boasted afterwards, you know, and this, this sticks in my throat. Many years later, he was at a conference at the Hyatt in Rosebank, mm -hmm. together with all these chums in Goldman Sachs and uh, mm -hmm. Old Mutual, Trevor Manuel, mm -hmm. Maria Ramos, you mm -hmm. know, that whole clique. Yeah. And he was boasting, he said, I trashed the ANC's nationalization program in a garbage bin in a hotel in Davao. And he laughed. So when former president, mm. the late Nelson Mandela, was reading the speech, couldn't you see that this speech has been changed? I don't know. I can just tell you what happened. I can tell you what Madiba did. Mm -hmm. I am not going to go beyond the facts. Mm -hmm. The facts are very clear because I was part of the team of people who wrote the speech for Madiba that the speech was totally changed. Mm -hmm. But it set in motion a process of the introduction of new liberal economic policies in the ANC, which was pushed even harder by President Thabo Mbeki after he came into the presidency following Madiba's retirement. Mm -hmm. And that new liberal economic pro policy program mm -hmm. has been sustained throughout in the ANC and under Cyril Ramaphosa now, it is Even on worse. steroids. Yeah. It's worse. Now we are being totally sold out. The only time that there was a bit of a holding back, mm -hmm. a bit of reversing from this new liberal economic policy program was during the time of President Jacob Zuma. Okay. But President Zuma also never really managed mm -hmm. to totally change mm -hmm. that policy program. He just managed to put the brakes onto it. Mm -hmm. But I understand that he was under a lot of pressure mm -hmm. and that there was a lot of reaction by the white monopoly capitalists against him when he came into power because he was never part of their plan. Mm -hmm. They never wanted him to become president. Okay. Another thing that I believe very strongly, Titus, is that it was no coincidence that comrade Chris Hani was assassinated. Is it? Comrade Chris was one of the most popular leaders in this country. Mm -hmm. And he was one of those who saw what was happening mm -hmm. at Kudesa. And he was criticizing. Mm -hmm. what was happening there in very clear terms. I remember a week before he was assassinated, I shared a stage with him in Boxburg, yes. where he said, Kudesa is going to be the death of the liberation struggle. It's going to destroy the ANC. Mm. The compromises that are being made, the compromises on land, the compromises also on the so-called sunset clauses, mm -hmm. the way in which civil servants from the white community are being guaranteed their jobs until they will retire, mm -hmm. will make it impossible for us to be able to change this country and give to our people what we've promised them. 
And I'm convinced that there were not just a little right-wing clique, Clive mm -hmm. Darby, Lewis, and Janusz Walusz. Mm -hmm. No, yeah. no, no. I'm convinced that there were also senior members of the African National Congress who were part of these sellouts, who had already become part mm -hmm. of these people who were now in the service of white monopoly capitalism, mm -hmm. who saw that Chris was a real danger to them. Because his popularity was unsurpassed. Mm -hmm. The likelihood that after Madiba retired, that Chris could have taken over as president was huge. Mm -hmm. And the white monopoly capitalists and imperialists said, never in our lives. Mm -hmm. Because this man has not bought into mm -hmm. the new liberal sellout policy program that we have introduced that we have infiltrated into mm -hmm. the African National Congress. He has to be removed. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason why Comrade Chris was assassinated. So the and way, I believe, yeah. I must say, make this point, mm -hmm. I believe that it is critical. And I hope that when the economic freedom fighters finally become the government of this country, mm -hmm. that we will return to investigate properly what happened with the assassination of Chris Hani? And how and who were involved also from the side of the ANC? Those files mustn't be closed. It is part of our liberation history, mm -hmm. and we owe it to the legacy of Comrade Chris to come out with the whole truth mm -hmm. and nothing but the truth. Indeed, we should get to the bottom of yes, this. Now, absolutely. You painted a picture of how the ANC has been infiltrated by mm. uh, white monopoly mon monopoly capital. Uh, obviously, you, you you pointed out the fact that they are enablers of white monopoly uh, capital, also citing a senior ANC uh, leaders. Would you say Nelson Mandela was one of the people who enabled white uh, monopoly capital? It's a difficult question because Madiba came at the latter part of his life mm -hmm. into a very complex environment where he needed to rely on good comrades to help him to take decisions. Mm -hmm. I don't think Madiba intentionally sold out. Mm -hmm. But I think part of the actions that he took also on the basis of advice that was given to him, led to a sellout process being put mm -hmm. into progress. So in that sense, one has to acknowledge that part of the selling out happened mm -hmm. during the first administration after the 1994, the 27th of April 1994 elections. Mm -hmm. And Madiba cannot be separated from that. But what I do believe is Madiba wanted to give us the first step mm -hmm. towards our democracy. Mm -hmm. We had a responsibility to take it further. We had a responsibility to now implement radical economic transformation programs mm -hmm. to give us that economic freedom in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. But we never did so. In fact, instead, we did nothing Mm -hmm. to change those dynamics that were first embedded in this new liberal constitution. Mm -hmm. One of the people I blame for that is Thabo Mbeki. Mm -hmm. Thabo Mbeki was the president of the ANC with the largest majority mm -hmm. in parliament. He was the president who had a two-thirds majority. Mm -hmm. He did nothing, do law law, <laughs> with that majority. It was wasted. Yeah, He could have changed the constitution because he had the two-thirds majority, the power to do so. Mm -hmm. He could have removed section 25 of the constitution. Mm -hmm. He could have returned the land to the people. He could have nationalized the South African Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. He could have taken that clause in the constitution that gives the Reserve Bank this very, very narrow definition that it is only supposed to concentrate on inflation targeting and it mustn't get involved in economic policy and economic growth mm -hmm. programs. All of those things that our fellow fighter, 
Advocate Busisivin Mkobani in her report, mm -hmm. the SIEX report and about APSA mm -hmm. and what happened with Bancorp, mm -hmm. she wrote in that report also that the South African Reserve Bank's mandate should change. Mm -hmm. Now, Tabo Mbeki knew that it had to change mm -hmm. if he really wanted to bring yeah. liberation and economic empowerment. Yeah. to the people. But those recommendations... He had the power. The, yeah, the recommendations the power. in the report never saw the light of day. But remember, this was now later that mm -hmm. she made that report, after Mbeki was already away. Mm -hmm. But remember that the reason, the main reason why Advocate Busisivin Kabane mm -hmm. became such a target of the ANC and of the establishment and also of the Democratic Alliance mm -hmm. was because of that report of hers. Because that went right to the core mm -hmm. of what needs to change in our society if we want to bring fundamental change. Mm -hmm. And they, after she had published that report, brought that report out as mm -hmm. public protector, mm -hmm. her fate was sealed. Then they had to remove her. They mm -hmm. didn't care how they did yeah. it. They didn't care how wrong the process was because the whole impeachment process was a farcical process, mm -hmm. but they had to remove her because she had put the finger on the real sore spot. And that is that economic entrenchment of inequality and of exploitation mm -hmm. as it is set there in the constitution yeah. and as it is set in the mandate mm -hmm. of the South African Reserve Bank. Mm -hmm. The ANC senior leaders that mm. you um, mentioned or pointed out, uh, do you think they acted wittingly or unwittingly um, on the events which led to the assassination of um, Chris Honey? Mm. Do you think they knew uh, about the repercussions of their actions, what it would lead to? And uh, do you think they could have done something to avert the assassination of um, Chris Honey? Let me start with the last part of your question. Mm -hmm. I believe that there were some of them involved. So obviously, having stated that, I believe they could have prevented it. You ask me about actions that are wittingly or unwittingly carried out. Mm -hmm. These are not stupid people. These are people who have been in the liberation struggle for years. Mm -hmm. They knew what they were doing. When I talk about infiltration mm -hmm. and I talk about how people were bought, it doesn't mean that it takes their intellectual and revolutionary faculties away from them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that they have now suddenly just become pawns in the hands of some big white monopoly capitalist and imperialist manipulators. Mm -hmm. They're not just puppets on a string. Mm -hmm. They made choices. And they made the wrong choices. Mm -hmm. They became people who cared only about themselves, their own pockets, mm -hmm. their own self-empowerment, their mm -hmm. own wealth. They stopped caring about the people. Mm -hmm. And they cannot escape the responsibility mm -hmm. of their actions. Mm -hmm. So we must never, when we talk about infiltration, mm -hmm. when we talk about how white monopoly capitalism planned mm -hmm. to subvert the African National Congress, mm -hmm. we must never take the responsibility for the selling out away from the sellouts. Mm -hmm. They must take responsibility for what they've done because they had a choice. Mm -hmm. They could have done better. They could have said no. But they said yes because they liked the money. They liked the wealth. They liked living in luxury. And at the same time, they betrayed the majority of people in this country. In fact, they doomed the majority of its people in this country to further poverty greater unemployment mm -hmm. to the kind of disasters that we saw at Marikana. Saro Ramaphosa cannot be said, oh, well, you know, he cannot be held responsible for what happened at Marikana. 
you know, he, he liked the money that he got from uh, that position that he had there as the chair of the company that controlled yep. things, etc. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Responsibility must be laid firmly and squarely at the door of that man. He, not anyone else, he wrote the concomitant email. And that email led to the action that led to the death concomitant of all the action. concomitant action, action yeah. email. Ne? Mm -hmm. He wrote it. Not anyone else. I, mm -hmm. I don't think someone sat there and took his finger and typed it. Mm -hmm. So he's, he has to be consciously kept responsible. Mm -hmm. But I want to make another point. Mm -hmm. Because we tend to concentrate simply just on the leadership yeah. at the top level of the African National Congress. The sad thing is that I've learned over many years, and I said to you, I stayed even longer than I should have, Advocate Mpofor sure. saw earlier than sure. me. But I learned over many years and very hard efforts for myself to try and change the ANC internally. Yes. That the ANC is beyond redemption. Mm. It is not just rotten at the top, not just Cyril Ramaphosa and a few of his accolades. Mm -hmm. The whole organization, from top to bottom, mm -hmm. is infiltrated, rotten, corrupt. Mm -hmm. It cannot be saved. Mm -hmm. And I came to that conclusion after I tried my level best to change it. And my view today is that it is a waste of time and energy to try and save the ANC. It is gone. Mm -hmm. In Afrikaans, we have a word, we call it kaput. It is finished. It's it is finished and clear. It is a rotten corpse. Mm -hmm. Any effort to try and save the ANC is the wrong application of one's energy. Mm -hmm. It diverts us from the real job, the real mm -hmm. task that we have, and that is to bring economic freedom in our lifetime. Yeah. And that economic freedom will not come through the ANC. Mm -hmm. It will have to come through a party such as the Economic Freedom Fighters. Yeah. And the empowerment of the EFF and the progressive left in general mm -hmm. is what our job is not to save the ANC. The ANC is beyond any saving. Mm. So, Comrade Carl, you are speaking so loud and nice about the politics of the left and obviously mm. now you are with the EFF, you have joined uh, the economic emancipation movement which is of course a radical and a militant uh, organization. What made you join uh, the EFF after such a long time uh, being with the ANC? As I said to you, mm -hmm. Last year, I decided the ANC is beyond redemption. Mm -hmm. Go and read my resignation letter. I say the ANC is finished. Mm -hmm. It's dead. I move on. And then I created, together with a couple of other comrades, the African Radical Economic Transformation mm -hmm. Alliance. Mm -hmm. Now, right from the beginning, Areta said our purpose is not just to exist for the sake of our own existence. Mm -hmm. Our purpose is to advance a radical economic transformation in this country. Mm -hmm. And our purpose is to work for unity amongst the progressive left. Okay. Because we believe very strongly that it is all only in our unity mm -hmm. as the left that we will be able to get rid of this sellout ANC government. Mm -hmm. So for 10 months... Areta had been doing that work. And for me, the most important part of the job that I was doing was to engage with other political parties on the left. Okay. To say, let's work for unity. Mm -hmm. Let's make sure that we have a minimum program of action mm -hmm. for economic freedom, for radical economic transformation. Mm -hmm. And three months ago, I came to a meeting with the other presidents of left progressive political parties mm -hmm. sitting around the table. Mm -hmm. And I said, guys, I want to, unfortunately, guys, ne? there were no women there. 
Yes. Also, it says something about what is wrong amongst us, that there uh, sure. are no women presidents in those parties. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's not the main point I want to make now. Mm -hmm. I said, can you tell me, do you all agree that the land must return to the people? They said, yes. I said, do you all agree that this African Reserve Bank must be nationalized? that we must stop the privatization of state-owned enterprises, that all must be under state control, mm -hmm. that we need to have a state bank. Mm -hmm. They said, yes, yes, we all agree. I said, so why are there so many of us around this table? Mm. How do we justify this kind of fracturing of the progressive left? Mm -hmm. I said, it's not about ideology, because you all tell me that you believe in the same thing. Mm -hmm. So it's about your egos. You like being called presidents. You like to see your faces on the posters on lamp poles. Positions. It's all about positions. Mm -hmm. It's not about the people. And I left that meeting convinced mm -hmm. that I cannot justify having said that in that meeting mm -hmm. for Areta simply to continue to exist yet as another small left party amongst this myriad of left parties. Mm -hmm. I said, we must unite. We must make the ballot paper shorter, not longer. Mm -hmm. We must have one flag, one logo on the ballot paper that clearly represents the, the radical the progressive future of our country. Mm -hmm. So I went to the National Working Board of Areta. Mm -hmm. We called it a National Working Board because we believed that we were busy with work in progress. Sure. I said, uh, please, mm -hmm. tell me where we must go. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot justify our independent existence mm -hmm. and adding to the divisions in the left. Mm -hmm. At that point already, I had made up my mind, I'm going to the EFF. But I wanted them to go and investigate for themselves. Okay. I said, within two weeks, come back, tell me. Mm -hmm. They came back after two weeks, the whole board, and they said unanimously, the EFF. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, why? I said, no, we've taken Areta's 10-point plan, we've taken the seven cardinal pillars of the EFF, and there's no difference. And it makes no sense for us as a small party to try and continue to exist sure. on our own. Sure. While there's a strong, progressive mm -hmm. party led by young, strong leaders mm -hmm. with great organizational ability mm -hmm. that we can join. Mm -hmm. I said, fantastic. Now let us go through the process of joining the EFF. Mm -hmm. So it took us about two months to consult, to engage with our various structures, mm -hmm. to explain our reasons. Then I was called by President Zuma. Okay. And President Zuma said to me, look, I'm going to launch or announce the launch of the MK party. Okay. And that I will support the MK party and that I will vote for the MK party. Mm. And he said, are you joining? I said, uh, Baba, I've got a few questions. Mm -hmm. First of all, what is your purpose for the launch of the MK party and your support for mm -hmm. the MK party? He said to save the ANC. I said, how? but Baba, how? Mm -hmm. He said, no, there's nothing wrong with the whole African National Congress. It is just... Cyril and a few of the top leaders that have gone wrong. Mm -hmm. I said, Baba, with all respect, and you know that I respect you and that I've supported you for many, many years, and sure. I truly have. Mm -hmm. I've been, I think, the only one in South Africa who attended every single one of President Zuma's court cases over the last 23 and a half years. It's you. And part of the reason why you were expelled from the ANC is I was expelled him. because <laughs> you were I was him. supporting and defending and yeah. protecting President Zuma. Mm -hmm. Because I said that our judiciary are captured in the context mm -hmm. of the very wrong decision that the Constitutional Court took when they sentenced President Zuma to 15 months of imprisonment. Mm -hmm. 
I said, Baba, with all respect, the ANC can't be saved. And any effort to try and save the ANC is misdirected energy. And we shouldn't misdirect our energy. He said, secondly, Baba, I don't think we must create more political parties. In fact, we must reduce the number. Mm -hmm. Now, to create another party in the form of the MK party is not helpful in terms of this divisions and diversity within the progressive left. Mm -hmm. I said, Baba, in honesty, I hear you. I respect you. I've always supported you. Mm -hmm. But my mind is made up and the mind of my national working board of Areta is made up mm -hmm. that the only real proper progressive thing that we can do today is to join the economic freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. Also because we believe that young leadership must be empowered and the EFF is a party of the youth. It has got strong young leaders mm -hmm. in the commander in chief, Comrade Julius Malema, in mm -hmm. the deputy president, Comrade Floyd Shivambu, mm -hmm. and other young leaders. Mm -hmm. I said, Baba, I love you, but with all respect, you're 81. Yeah, it's old. Now, I'm not trying to undermine President Zuma on the basis of age. Mm -hmm. But even myself, I'm sitting here, I'm 64. Mm -hmm. For a little while, for 10 months, I called myself the president, or I was called by my supporters, the president of Areta. Mm -hmm. But that was unimportant. That's not what it's about when you're a revolutionary. It's about the struggle, not about a title. And I, as an older person, must admit that we have made mistakes. Although I fought against the selling out process in the African National Congress. Mm -hmm. Although I sometimes stood like my finger alone outside Nazarek and other meetings of the National Executive of the ANC calling for Ramaphosa and others to go. Mm -hmm. I must also acknowledge that I've been part of the mistakes in the ANC. Sure. And I cannot come and claim leadership to the future. Mm -hmm. What I can do now is to be there to assist to support mm -hmm. the empowerment of young, strong leaders. Mm -hmm. And those I find in the economic freedom fighters. Yes, yes. So at the end of all of that discussion with President Zuma, I said, Baba, I'm making a very clear, deliberate, mm -hmm. unequivocal decision. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to join the MK party. Mm -hmm. I've made up my mind I'm joining the economic freedom fighters and because the EFF mm -hmm. is the future mm -hmm. and I want to be part of, of the, the future. future. Yeah. I want to see economic freedom in our lifetime, not in a different lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I don't want any confusion about what I stand for. Mm -hmm. I also don't want to be part of a faction in the ANC mm -hmm. because I fear that there are still some who today join the MK party mm -hmm. who don't give up their membership for the ANC because they continue to see the possibility of dual membership because at the essence, at the heart of what they're doing is to save the ANC. But the problem is when you want to save the ANC, you're going to try and contain and help and assist all the flotsam, mm -hmm. all the rubbish will but continue how, to come along yeah, with you. But the question now is how do you save the ANC with another political party? Because ANC is a political party. Can't be MK said. is a political well, MK, party is a political party, but MK is also at the same time an expression of a faction of the ANC. Is it the RET? I would, beg your pardon? Would you say it's the RET I don't forces? know. It or may contain MK? part of the RET, mm -hmm. but what I see from MK is that it still has as its mission to save the ANC. And as the commander-in-chief mm -hmm. 
said in his press conference on Friday, that mm -hmm. is an impossible duty. Mm -hmm. It's a task that one shouldn't take on yourself because it's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. We must direct our efforts to the future, mm -hmm. to fundamental, radical economic transformation. Mm -hmm. And that is what the EFF stands for. Mm -hmm. And what I love about the EFF is the EFF does what it says it will do. It will do. The EFF doesn't go around making empty promises. When it says we're going to do that, it does it. Mm -hmm. When the EFF enters into a coalition in significant municipalities and in government, mm -hmm. its representatives in that coalition does the work. Mm -hmm. Go and do what is, uh, see what has happened in Etiquini. Mm -hmm. This year, the swimming pools were open. The beaches were clean. Mm -hmm. That was the role of representatives of the EFF mm -hmm. in Etiquini. Mm -hmm. Go and see what members of the EFF in the mayoral committee is doing here in the metro in Johannesburg, in mm -hmm. Ekuruleni. Mm -hmm. They do what they promise to do. Mm -hmm. The other thing I love about the commander in chief is consequential management. Mm -hmm. You either work or you're gone. Mm -hmm. You either deliver or you leave. Yeah. Simple. And in South Africa, We've seen a situation where people have impunity. Mm -hmm. They make promises. They don't fulfill the promises. Mm -hmm. There's no service delivery. There's no consequence for the lack of service delivery. Mm -hmm. People keep on returning to positions of power despite abject failure mm -hmm. and no delivery. Yeah. And I love what Comrade Julius Malema, our Commander-in-Chief, does. Mm -hmm. If you don't work, if you don't deliver, you pay, you face the consequences. If you don't pay for a bus, you're no, gone. You face the consequences. Yeah. And that is something which shouldn't just be part of the culture of the EFF as much as I love that culture. Mm -hmm. It should be part of the future culture of our country, of our government. Mm -hmm. And that's why I love to see the EFF in power, in government, and Comrade Julius as the president of South Africa, so that the same attitude of consequential management mm -hmm. can be implemented. You know, sure. I commented when I walked into this revolutionary house today, <laughs> when yeah, Iman yeah. Kazela Mandela <laughs> house, <laughs> the cleanliness. and I'm looking at everything works. Mm -hmm. It's clean. It's proper. Mm -hmm. And I compare it to what I've experienced. I haven't been in the Thule house for the last year, but I'm sure it's worse now. <laughs> but, you know, the dust used to walk with you. Mm. The wallpaper was crawling off the walls, coming towards you, peeling off. <laughs> There's no brooms to be found to clean anywhere. It's the place is in disgusting filth. So the now is, that is an, yeah. no no I want to make this point. Sure. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. Sure, go ahead. Uh, that is the expression mm -hmm. of the internal rot mm. in the ANC. You know, there's an old saying: if you can't do right on the small things, you're never going to do right on the big things. Mm. If you cannot keep your house clean. Mm -hmm. How on God's earth are you going to run a country? If you cannot manage your finances, mm. if you cannot pay your staff, as has happened with the ANC, if you allow yourself to be entered into a financial dilemma where, you know, you're on the verge of being sequestrated. Yeah. How on yeah. God's earth are you going to run the complicated intricate processes of governance. Mm -hmm. And we can see it. What happens in Letulia House mm -hmm. is the microcosm mm -hmm. of what the ANC has been doing to the whole mm -hmm. of South Africa. And here in Winnie Mandela, Marikazela Mandela House, mm -hmm. I see the exact opposite. Huh? So I okay. walked in here and I said, I'm home. Mm -hmm. This is my home. This is where I want to be. Mm -hmm. 
And I see on social media there are those people who say to me, well, you, why don't you go to MK Party? Yes. We think you should come there. Yes. We think the culture of MK Party suits you better. Why? Mm -hmm. There's no such. Mm -hmm. I've made a clear, unequivocal, very mm -hmm. rational decision yeah. to become a fighter in the economic freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. Let everyone understand me clearly. Mm -hmm. I knew that President Zuma was going to announce okay. the MK party. Mm -hmm. It didn't catch me off guard. Mm -hmm. He told me exactly what he was going to do mm -hmm. in advance. Mm -hmm. And I told President Zuma exactly mm -hmm. what I was going to do and the other members of Areta were what going to, to do, do yeah. in advance. Yeah. He knew yeah. when we called that press conference two days before he made his announcement mm -hmm. that we were going to announce that we as individual members mm -hmm. of Areta are joining the economic freedom fighters. Yeah. And I'm here to work. Mm -hmm. I'm not here to play. Mm. I'm here to be available for any job yeah. and the I've EFF seen, wants yeah. to give me. I told the commander-in-chief when I met him on Saturday, mm -hmm. I'm here to work. I'm at the service of the economic freedom fighters. Tell me what to do. I will do it. And now yeah. we must campaign and fight to make the EFF the largest party that will become the government mm -hmm. of South Africa after the 2024 elections. Because this 2024 mm -hmm. must be our 1994. Indeed, it is our 1994. And Absolutely. I've seen you... Um, on the ground uh, already mm. engaging with fighters, uh, recruiting uh, fighters. And mm -hmm. on the question of the MK party formed by former President Jacob Zuma, one would think that given your strong relationship with him, you would have perhaps wanted to work with him closely. But now given the reasons that you have outlined, are you then saying MK is sort of a replica of the ANC because... Uh, given what the, the the president of the, I'm not sure if former President Zuma is the president of MK, but given what President Zuma has said about MK, you don't see that objective which seeks to represent the poor and the marginalized. Look, I don't want, I'm not here to decampaign President Zuma. Mm -hmm. And I think it wouldn't be also in the interest of the progressive left. Mm -hmm in our country to do so. Mm -hmm. And I do think it was a courageous thing for President Zuma with his history. Mm -hmm. We know his very strong mm -hmm. affinity and his very strong love for the ANC mm -hmm. to have made that announcement sure. that he was not going to vote for the ANC and that he calls on people to vote for the MK party and that mm -hmm. he will vote mm -hmm. for the MK party. Mm -hmm. So I'm not here to decampaign him or the MK party. Mm, of course, yes. Because I believe still that it should be possible for the various progressive left forces in South Africa to work together, and I include mm -hmm. the MK party as part of that. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that I'm concerned about the way in which the MK party comes over mm -hmm as another faction of the ANC rather than an independent party. Mm -hmm. I'm concerned about this task that President Zuma says he had given himself to save the ANC because I don't believe mm -hmm. the ANC can be saved. I've said that for more than a year now, unequivocally so. Sure. And I would be inconsistent mm -hmm. If today I was suddenly turning around and saying I'm going to become a part of a project to save the ANC when I said the ANC is dead, because you don't resurrect the corpse. Mm -hmm. It's dead. I'm not one of those fake pastors who believe that you can resurrect corpses. Mm -hmm. The ANC is dead. Mm -hmm. So it is wasted energy and effort. Yeah. As the commander in chief said, it would have been a great boost to the EFF if President Zuma said he will vote for the EFF. Mm -hmm. But okay, he decided to go the route of the MK party. Mm -hmm. With all my reservations mm -hmm. about the MK party and 
the kind of task or duty that it has given itself mm -hmm. and the way in which it still represents itself really as a faction of the ANC. Mm -hmm. I still hope that all of us will be able to work together. Mm -hmm. I still hope that in the future, we will be able to unite left progressive forces, mm -hmm. which will include mm -hmm. also the MK party. But I'm strongly of the conviction that the EFF mm -hmm. is the political party that should take the lead because it has sure. earned its stripes. Mm -hmm. I'm strongly of the conviction that my job today is first and foremost mm -hmm. to mobilize for the EFF, for the growth of the membership of the EFF, and for the growth of the voting South African public mm -hmm. to vote for the economic freedom fighters. Mm -hmm. I want to see the F EFF emerging mm -hmm. out of the 2024 elections in all the provinces and nationally mm -hmm. as the strongest party and as the party of governance. Mm -hmm. The people of South Africa deserve mm -hmm. an economic liberation mm -hmm. in our lifetime. It deserves strong, young, mm -hmm. committed, consequential. Yeah decisive leadership mm -hmm. and all of that is being provided by the if so, if so i'm yeah. in my heart as i'm translating now directly from an old dutch saying in my bone and marrow in my being and murch mm -hmm. i'm a member of the eff yeah. i'm a fighter of the eff mm -hmm. i want to see the eff as the government mm -hmm. of south africa indeed in in just less than uh, five months we're going into the seventh um, uh, democratic elections. But exactly. now, earlier on, you spoke about the ANC SG Fikilem Balula um, while addressing the media. He said, <laughs> well, look, <laughs> they act really, in defense of... <laughs> we've had a serious discussion up to now. Now yeah. you want to come and lower the level of the discussion. Why not? I want to understand. <laughs> I mean, someone comes out now and say the ANC misled parliament, misled the public about uh, a swimming pool being, mm. you know, a fire pool. What do you make of such statement? <laughs> Is it a last kick of a dying horse? <laughs> what do you you make know, of there's an old saying, mm. those that God want to destroy, he first makes mad. <laughs> Are you saying and I listen to that madness by Fakilim Balula. So what he was by implication telling us is, yeah, we, we, we're backing President Ramaphosa, we're covering up on Pala Pala. We know that it's wrong, but we're continuing to do it because- In defense of their it, we We are in defense mm. of this crook and we will continue to do so, mm. regardless of what we know is wrong. Mm -hmm. That is what he was really telling us. Mm -hmm. You see, and that is what we have been saying, the ANC has become a criminal enterprise. Mm. It is no longer even a political party. It is a mafia institution, which is only concerned about the sustaining of its own power, of the money that it can steal from the people of this country. Mm -hmm. And at the head of this organization, as the old saying goes, a fish rots from the head, oh, yeah. is the main mafia character, mm -hmm. Sir Ramaphosa, because there is no way, there is absolutely no way that you can defend what happened at Palapala. Pala. Mm -hmm. It was criminal in terms of the amount of money there, in terms of the breaking of the various rules and the regulations around foreign exchange. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can justify not reporting a so-called crime. Mm -hmm. There's no way you can justify gender-based violence because a domestic worker, a woman domestic worker, mm -hmm. was illegally detained and tortured. Mm -hmm. You cannot justify what the South African Reserve Bank did. You cannot justify what the South African Revenue Service did. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot. Yeah. And Advocate Wusisiva Nkabane asked mm -hmm. 32 questions mm -hmm. that exposed the whole rot that was going on there. Mm -hmm. And in return, she was immediately suspended. 
and as a thank you for a service to the nation to mm -hmm. try and get the people of South Africa to realize how deep the criminality in our country goes, she was eventually mm -hmm. impeached. Yeah. So that is, that is what Ramaphosa does. He removes people mm -hmm. who challenge him, he pays off where he can, mm -hmm. and he pays his way into positions. And All of that yeah. is the conduct of a don of the mafia. And that is what Cyril Ramaphosa is, a mafia don. He's and, not a president. Yeah. He should never have been the leader of this country. Yeah. He was parachuted. Mm -hmm. And I, I must talk about this for just a second. He was parachuted. <laughs> yeah into the leadership of the ANC in 1991 mm -hmm. at the then Durban conference coming from nowhere. Mm -hmm. No one actually even knew if Cyril Ramaphosa was at that stage when he walked into that conference a member of the ANC. Mm -hmm. I sat two chairs away on the stage mm -hmm. from comrade Oliver Reginald Tambu. Mm -hmm. And when Ramaphosa walked into the conference hall, he said, Barney Law. <laughs> who's that? <laughs> that who's that? Nobody. Mm -hmm. At the end of the conference suddenly was the Secretary General. Mm -hmm. Why? Because the white monopoly capitalists came and told Madiba, make Ramaphosa the Secretary General. Irene Menel, Clive Menel, Harry Oppenheimer, mm -hmm. those were Cyril Ramaphosa's campaign managers oh. for him to become the Secretary General of the ANC. Okay. It was a disaster when he became Secretary General. I worked with that So man. the same modus operandi repeated itself in 2017? Well, it's actually a bigger tragedy because yeah. one of my disagreements, of yeah. my few disagreements that I had with President Zuma mm -hmm. was in a disagreement that I had in, with him in 2012 when Ramaphosa was brought in at the ANC's national conference in Manga Hung as the deputy president. Mm -hmm. And when he was elected, I walked onto the stage. I went up to President Zuma. I said, President, I'm leaving this conference. I'm not even going yep. to wait for your final concluding speech mm -hmm. because this is the biggest mistake mm -hmm. that you've made in your life. Yes. I know this man. I worked with him. He's a sellout. He only cares about money. You will regret what you've done today to resuscitate his political life yeah, yeah. for the rest of your life. And a while ago when I met President Zuma in Kandla, he said to me, you know, you were right. I said, yes, it's sad that I have to say I told you so. So in, in fact, would you say Ramaphosa has put a final, in fact, hammered a final nail on the ANC coffin with all his shenanigans? Of course. But he was already busy killing the ANC many years before. Mm -hmm. He was the central figure in the destruction of our liberation ideals through the Kudesa negotiations, him and Praveen Gordon. Mm -hmm. And he was brought back to come now and to hammer the final nail mm -hmm. into the coffin of the ANC. And we must get rid, not just of him, but of that whole ANC. In sure. fact, I think we need a cremation ceremony, not even a funeral. <laughs> because Corrine, even that yeah. coffin yeah. that the ANC is in, that coffin where you say he hammered the final nail, even yeah. that coffin must be cremated. <laughs> the works. ANC and everything associated yeah. with sure. itself is a disaster for this country now. Yeah. In less than five months, South Africa is going into uh, its uh, seventh uh, provincial and uh, you know national, national and provincial elections. Uh, yeah. elections. Mm -hmm. What are your expectations? My hope is that the EFF will emerge as the largest mm -hmm. political party in South Africa. Mm -hmm. I know many people will say to me, but you're crazy to think so and hope so. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. There is a true sea change mm -hmm. in this country. We've reached a watershed moment. Mm -hmm. And all of us in the economic freedom fighters must now work day and night mm -hmm to bring in every day new members, new voters, to work ourselves to a standstill, mm -hmm. to get as many South Africans who are not yet registered as voters to register, mm -hmm. to motivate them to vote, 
and to motivate them to vote for the economic freedom fighters. I want to see mm -hmm. at the end of these elections, and EFF as the largest political party, mm -hmm. and I want to be able to go and sit there in that amphitheater sure. at the union buildings. Yeah. And I want to see Comrade Julius, mm -hmm. the commander Salo in chief, Malema, the commander yeah. in chief, mm -hmm. taking the oath of to become the president of South Africa. Mm -hmm. That is why I'm here. That's what I'm working for. That is what all of us in the EFF must put our shoulders to the wheel nonstop mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to an incredible turnout at Moses Mabida Stadium. Of course. I'm sure we're going to fill the stadium, the overflows and everything else. Yeah. We're going to show everyone mm -hmm. that there is no political no-go zones oh, yeah, 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 in yeah, South absolutely. Africa. Yeah. And that the EFF stands strong, unequivocally mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. everywhere and especially also mm -hmm. in KwaZulu-Natal. Yeah. Now, as we wind up, uh, in the build-up to the election, there have been mushrooming of uh, splinter parties, mm. you know, Rise, um, uh, Sarah, a lot of them mm. have come up uh, lately. What do you think is their, uh, uh, these political party motives? It's all there to undermine our democracy, mm -hmm. to prevent mm -hmm. the progressive agenda from succeeding. Mm -hmm. They're being financed as the commander in chief said in the press conference, Rise Mzanzi and these parties are financed by foreign economic powers and even foreign countries, governments. Mm -hmm. The intention is to subvert our democracy, yeah. to prevent fundamental economic transformation from happening in South Africa, to confuse mm -hmm. the voting public in South Africa. Mm -hmm. And our message must be an unequivocal one. Don't allow yourself to be attracted by these fly-by-night mm -hmm. little parties that are funded by foreign funders. Mm -hmm. Stick to your guns, literally. Sure. Stay with the EFF. Mm -hmm. Stay with the undertaking that the EFF has made that there must be economic freedom mm -hmm. in our lifetime. Don't allow yourself to be misled mm -hmm. by the shenanigans of charlatans mm -hmm. stay with the real thing. Sure. And the real thing mm -hmm. in South Africa today is the, EFF. is the EFF. Yeah. Do you think South Africa is ready for a coalition um, government, given, obviously, the rise of these political parties? Okay. There are a lot of them. I mm -hmm. think there are over 600 now on the ballot. I'm not a great fan of coalition government. Mm -hmm. I would prefer to see the EFF as the overall victor and the government of this country. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't turn out to be like that, what I would like to, um, to see is the EFF being the strongest, mm -hmm. the largest party, mm -hmm. so that if there is a need for coalitions, mm -hmm. because of the size of the EFF and the numerical support from the voting public, sure that the EFF has received, mm -hmm. that it will be able to dictate the conditions mm -hmm. of such a coalition. Mm -hmm. Because even if we go into coalition, it must be led by a strong, radical, progressive mm -hmm. party, black party, mm -hmm. which is the EFF. Mm -hmm. And it must be for the economic empowerment of the people of mm -hmm. South Africa, especially the African people. Mm. Comrade Kalni has... No doubt, you are a proponent of uh, economic emancipation. Thank you, my uh, In our lifetime, and indeed, uh, 2024 is our 1994. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of uh, today's episode of the EFF uh, podcast. Uh, Comrade uh, Kalne has, of course, joined the EFF and looking forward to uh, the outright uh, majority Absolutely. victory of the EFF. Uh, anything you want to say as a parting shot? My parting shot is to say thank you to the Commander-in-Chief for the warm mm -hmm. welcome that I've received in the Economic Freedom Fighters. Thank mm -hmm. you also to the fighters, mm -hmm. those grassroots forces, ground forces of the EFF that mm -hmm. embraced me mm 
mm-hmm. and my fellow former members of Areto who joined the EFF. Mm-hmm. Now we are going to work mm-hmm. because 2024 is going to be our 1994. Yeah. Aluta. Aluta. Continue. Yeah, is your family registered to vote? Is your wife uh, registered to we vote? We're all registered to vote and we're all going to vote EFF. Yeah, all right. Even my little boy, if he could have voted, he's only six years old, would have voted EFF. Mm-hmm. He's already got his red beret. Wow, that's fantastic. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for watching. This is the EFF podcast. Of course, on t- uh, continue uh, subscribing to the EFF uh, YouTube channel for more on the EFF uh, podcast. Remember, uh, registration is still uh, open mm-hmm. uh, on the 4th, uh, between the 3rd and the 4th of February. Uh, registration, it will be the registration weekend. Uh, everyone yeah, but the important to, thing uh, yeah. is that uh, people can actually register anytime. Yeah, they can go online, online yes. and register. Yes, there is a registration weekend coming up, but yeah. I think we must urge people yeah. to even go online and register yeah, as many as possible. Yeah. 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 On that note, uh, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Titus Tungu. Until we meet again, good ekwengeta. Thank you. Stand up, South Africa. Make sure that South Africa, you are counted with me. Run, South Africa. Stand and make sure that our people understand that the need to be revolution in South Africa is guaranteed that under the EFF, this country will be the better. EFF is a combat thing.